My name is Brett Nelson from the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. We're going to be speaking about point of care ultrasound today, specifically the evaluation of ectopic pregnancy. So as with all ultrasound applications at the point of care, we want to have a focused question before we approach the patient. In this case, we're evaluating essentially the uterus and we want to have uh, one question in mind, is there an intrauterine pregnancy? Now this application is a little different um, than others because we're going to typically evaluate for ectopic pregnancy by looking to see whether a patient has a pregnancy inside the uterus. We'll get on more of that in a moment. So there are several goals in the clinical evaluation of a patient during the first trimester of pregnancy who's coming in typically with abdominal pain or vaginal bleeding. The whole scope of the evaluation is beyond the scope of this talk, which will focus on the ultrasound evaluation of ectopic pregnancy. But keep in mind that part of your assessment is going to uh, be to evaluate for ectopic pregnancy. And we do that by ruling out ectopic pregnancy by ruling in intrauterine pregnancy. We're going to evaluate for a urinary tract infection, assess whether there's a need for rogam given the uh, vaginal bleeding, and perhaps exclude alternative pathology like appendicitis, cholecystitis, pelvic infection, and other things. So where do ectopic pregnancies occur? What is it? Uh, it's a pregnancy outside of the uterus, but more specifically, it's outside of the portions of myometrium that are designed to carry a pregnancy to term. So we're familiar with probably the more common areas uh, through the isthmus or the ampulla, which are where the largest majority of the ectopic pregnancies occur. Certainly, um, we can find them around the fimbria and the fallopian tubes as well. Um, but just as a bit of foreshadowing for later in the talk, you can have pregnancies that are technically inside the uterus, cervical ectopics or interstitial ectopics, which represent pregnancies that have implanted in areas in the, in, inside the uh, uterus that are not designed to uh, hold the placenta and the embryonic structures and fetal structures through a course of pregnancies. These can be very dangerous because they will tend to rupture much later than pregnancies that are ectopically located in in the abdominal cavity or the fallopian tube or around the ovaries. So when the um, uterus ruptures at 12, 14, 18 weeks, um, it's much more dangerous. There's much more blood supply, a greater percentage of the uh, maternal cardiac outputs going into the uterus at that point than what you find during the early phase. But any ruptured ectopic is uh, potentially a life-threatening uh, emergency, and we want to evaluate for this before it gets to that point. So a very brief review of the anatomy we can see here in this uh, sagittal section through the female pelvis, the uterus uh, right in the center here, and just anterior to that, we see the bladder. And notice that the bladder is just anterior to the uterus, and the pubic symphysis is just anterior to the bladder. This anatomic relationship is going to become important later as we look at the transabdominal assessment through the uterus. We see the vaginal canal, sometimes referred to as the vaginal cuff uh, on ultrasound, um, coming down here towards the introitus from the cervix and the um, rectum coming behind it. Also notice in this view where the pelvic cul-de-sac or the pouch of Douglas lies. It lies uh, posterior and inferior to the uterus just above the rectum. And looking into the pelvis, as if you're facing the female pelvis, we see the relationship between the uterus here in the center, and then moving out laterally, the fallopian tubes and the ovaries. And then just lateral to the ovaries, we see the iliac artery and vein. And this is, again, important when we think about evaluating the uterus, both transabdominally, but more important, transvaginally, starting off in the midline, finding the uterus, moving out more lateral, and then you should see the uh, uter uh, the um, ovaries in between the uterus and the iliac vessel. So that is a pretty classic anatomic relationship to keep in mind as you look at the ovaries. So ectopic pregnancy is something that concerns emergency physicians because in our practice environment, it's a bit more common than it is in other outpatient environments or clinic environments. So it can occur in up to 1 in 64 pregnancies, and there are over 80,000 of these admitted uh, annually. 7 to 8 percent of emergency department patients coming in with a complication in their first trimester, abdominal pain or vaginal bleeding, are found to have ectopic pregnancy. And this is consistent across many studies in an emergency department environment. And this, again, is a higher number than you typically see reported in the OB literature for uh, a clinic patient or, or an outpatient environment.
Forty-five percent of these can be missed on their initial emergency department visit, largely because of difficulties with imaging and some subtle presentations at first. So we'll talk about some ways to uh, minimize this risk and keep your patients safe and do the best evaluations that we can. So we can effectively rule this out in the emergency department um, by demonstrating that there is an intrauterine pregnancy. The logic being that if there's a pregnancy inside the uterus, there isn't a pregnancy outside the uterus. The obvious definition of heterotopic then uh, is the case that makes this false, and these occur pretty infrequently. Typically, you'll see reported in the literature that it happens one in a, uh, about one in 30,000 cases. Um, this number, though, is a, a mathematical number. It comes from statistics on ectopics um, multiplied by statistics on intrauterine pregnancies, so it's not that there's a true annual incidence in the population epidemiologically of 1 in 30,000. Um, it seems like uh, it's the, the number is probably a little bit higher than this, although still very low, and uh, some authors have reported uh, incidence of 1 to in six or 7,000 in patients with assisted reproductive technology. So um, even in those patients, it's, it's a really rare scenario. Think of uh, other uh, clinical uh, diagnostic uh, problems that you encounter in your daily practice where you would be as confident as saying with one in 7,000 certainty that you can rule something out. We certainly don't have that for pulmonary embolism or MI or a host of other diseases. Um, so people still worry about heterotopics and it's pretty reasonable. We are going to be um, uh, assisted in our evaluation of most of your assisted reproductive uh, patients with uh, obstetrics and gynecology. It's rare that a patient who is undergoing uh, very expensive, time-consuming um, IVF therapy is going to come to the local emergency department without consulting their obstetrician as well. So you're generally not referring to these patients uh, in a vacuum. But uh, it's helpful to know that in the cases of heterotopic, it's, it's probably worth a more careful assessment um, than just looking for intrauterine pregnancy. So serum HCG uh, comes up all the time. It's certainly a valuable test to have. It's worth trending it. Um, there's a bit of a pitfall in assuming that the serum HCG could help you in ruling in or ruling out ectopic. Um, certainly a positive serum HCG proves someone's pregnant, but uh, it, you can't tell much more than that. Serum HCG roughly correlates with size of the fetus, and it correlates with the age of the pregnancy, and it does rise reliably exponentially during the first six to eight weeks. The classic teaching is that it doubles every 48 hours. Really what we should expect is that it should increase by at least 66% every 48 hours um, during the first um, uh, trimester of pregnancy. Really important to note, though, that a low HCG does not rule out ectopic pregnancy. Um, 30 to 40% of ectopic pregnancies that are ruptured at the time of diagnosis have a level of less than 1,000, which is less than the discriminatory zone. And uh, if you look at many papers that have been published on methotrexate administration for known documented ectopic pregnancies, you'll see um, tables in those studies where they'll demonstrate the uh, HCG levels, and there'll be 100, 500, 2,000, 6,000, 45. So you'll see double and triple digit numbers very frequently in these cases. And your obstetrics colleagues will have seen it as well. So in case you get into uh, a discussion or a disagreement with radiology or, or obstetrics, just look at some of the methotrexate literature on a patient population that has a known um, entity of ectopic pregnancy, and, um, and it usually helps to make the argument a little bit that a low HCG does not rule out the diagnosis of ectopic. So what is this discriminatory zone? <clears throat> it was first described in the 1980s, um, and it was meant to be um, a way to tell uh, if there was a beta HCG level above which you would expect to see an intrauterine pregnancy. So there's a couple things with this. Um, certainly the um, whether you should expect reliably to see a pregnancy inside the uterus or not, again, that's a sort of a different argument than ruling out ectopic. Um, and then the other thing is that the ultrasound technology was certainly a lot different in 1981 than it was today. So at that point, um, about 1,000 um, milli-international units per milliliter, you should be able to see a gestational sac. And greater than 2,000, you should be able to see a yolk sac, um, maybe with embryonic uh, parts. So this is where this, uh, this discriminatory zone concept comes from and why you hear people talking about you should be able to see an intrauterine pregnancy using a transvaginal approach at 1,500 or 2,000 uh, HCG level. You should be able to see it transabdominally by 5,000. And again, this might be 
helpful for you if you're not seeing anything and the HCG is high, it should make you want to look harder, but it shouldn't make you think in the opposite sense that if you don't see anything and the HCG level is low, that you shouldn't worry about it, that ectopic pregnancy is somehow less likely because the HCG level is low. So it's helpful, and many departments and institutions have come up with algorithms to uh, facilitate the care of patients who are coming in with uh, abdominal pain or vaginal bleeding during the first trimester of their pregnancy. In a patient in this situation who's hemodynamically unstable, in many cases, a positive pregnancy test alone um, would be uh, worth the patient getting resuscitated and taking to the operating room uh, with obstetrics and gynecology for laparoscopy. Um, and certainly there are many cases where a otherwise healthy young woman with a positive pregnancy test, some free fluid in the abdomen, even using a fast exam or looking at the peritoneum with no definitive proof of an, uh, an ectopic uh, gets taken down to the OR with the presumption of this highly unstable disease process. And, and typically that's exactly what the cause is. Um, in the setting of a patient who's stable, then we have a bit more branches in the tree. It's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit more complicated. Certainly a, um, a pelvic examination, uh, blood tests as indicated, and a urinalysis and a pregnancy test should be confirmed. And then we're basically trying to assess that the patient has an intrauterine pregnancy. Again, this is how we rule out ectopics. We prove there's an intrauterine pregnancy. So if we can do this either with a radiology study or a study at the point of care, which is the point of today's talk, we can demonstrate that um, there's a pregnancy inside the uterus where it belongs and therefore no ectopic. So a patient who is hemodynamic stable, who has an intrauterine pregnancy, and no other reason uh, that to be concerned can be safely discharged with obstetrics follow-up. Patient who doesn't have an intrauterine pregnancy, um, we need to uh, really assess uh, for ectopic a little more closely. And sometimes that means a thorough assessment uh, with point of care sonography, um, looking at the uterus, perhaps looking at the adnexa as well. And in many institutions, that means um, uh, considering a radiology consultation as well, uh, perhaps to get a better look for the actual ectopic. So instead of just looking at the uterus to find an IUP, the radiologist's role is to look more in the anexa and other areas to try to find signs of an ectopic. Now, beta HCG levels wind up sneaking their way into a lot of these guidelines, even though uh, we know that it shouldn't reassure us that there's no ectopic. Um, but it, if anything, a, a higher beta could make you more concerned that there, you might be missing an ectopic, but again, a lower beta shouldn't make you less concerned. So um, looking, especially here in the setting of a low beta, at nexal mass, tenderness, fullness, either on point of care uh, sono or on radiology sono, and a patient who doesn't have any sonographic signs of ectopic pregnancy, meaning their nexa look clear, there's no free fluid in their abdomen, there's no intrauterine pregnancy, but they're not too tender and they don't have uh, mass and they seem hemodynamically stable and they don't have a significant amount of bleeding, can in consultation with obstetrics um, be discharged home for follow-up. Patients like this typically will get a repeat beta HCG at 48 hours to assess the trend uh, whether the uh, pregnancy is uh, progressing normally or not. Um, certainly, if there is any concern, the emergency physician as well as obstetric should be worried about ectopic pregnancy. So persistent tenderness, mass, fluid in the abdomen, et cetera, um, in the setting of a high or a low beta should prompt a, a GYN evaluation for ectopic pregnancy. And again, having discussions about this by the light of day and setting up algorithms and care plans for these patients um, when obstetrics and emergency medicine and radiology can come to the table together is very helpful so that these things aren't decided uh, on a case-by-case -case basis in the middle of the night when resources become scarce. If we all agree on a Tuesday afternoon over some lunch that uh, patients who don't have a definitive intrauterine pregnancy on point-of-care ultrasound should get a radiology study at 2 in the morning, then that's what happens. But if we come up with this for the first time at 2 in the morning, it's much more difficult to uh, get your consultants um, together on the same page. So uh, in our department here at Sinai, we've, we've used uh, a version of this algorithm that we came up with in, in consultation with radiology and obstetrics, uh, including a poster with some images of what normal and ectopic pregnancies look like and a bit of an assessment of how um, our point-of-care ultrasound machines are used and how to save uh, images appropriately. And this has uh, helped us a lot in terms of evaluating our first trimester uh, complications. So let's have a look at some examples of pelvic ultrasound and uh, the anatomy that we should be looking for.
So again, there's a lot of literature on this. Here's just a smattering of the uh, early literature demonstrating that patients evaluated at the point of care by emergency physicians, demonstrating an intrauterine pregnancy by, depending on the study, either fetal parts or a yolk sac, was a safe and efficient method of um, uh, evaluating for ectopic pregnancy, and patients could be safely discharged when they had IUP demonstrated. Several of these studies also demonstrating a, uh, a time savings with a decreased length of stay in the emergency department for these patients. So the patient should be um, in a recumbent position for the transabdominal scan and in a lithotomy position for their transvaginal scan. I'm deliberately putting them in this order because the patient should always have an abdominal scan performed first um, for several reasons. Uh, one is that the um, the broader view that a transabdominal scan gives you can sometimes help you to not be fooled by abnormal pathology or by a uterus that's off from center one way or the other or is antiverted or retroverted, some stuff that can make uh, transvaginal scanning occasionally difficult. And uh, also sometimes free fluid shows up on a transabdominal scan or even um, extra uterine um, uh, masses can show up on a transabdominal scan pretty well. And sometimes, frankly, patients aren't as pregnant as they think they are or they're more pregnant than they think they are. So someone who thinks they're in their first trimester who has a vaginal ultrasound performed, um, your, your vaginal ultrasound may be zoomed in too far and you're essentially looking at a cervix. And that can fool some providers into thinking that they're seeing an empty uterus. So looking transabdominally first, even when you think and the patient thinks you're looking for a gestational sac or a yolk sac at best, you put a transabdominal probe on the patient and you see a 25, 26 week uh, fetus uh, floating around and waving at you inside of that uterus. Um, that's something that you definitely don't want to miss. And in, in, in further along in pregnancy, you want to be cautious about what you do place inside the vagina, uh, performing sterile exams later on during pregnancy and not performing unnecessary uh, transvaginal ultrasounds. So start transabdominal, then transvaginal every time. So which probes would you use? So for transabdominal, um, we'll start with either a phased array or a curvilinear probe, depending on what you have available. So whatever you use for your abdominal imaging is going to give you the best images for transabdominal evaluation of the uterus. Make sure you use your obstetrics presets on the machine, not just because that's going to optimize the image for visualizing things like the uterus and the adnexa, but also if you want to measure things like um, uh, gestational sac diameter, uh, femur length, crown rump length, or other assessments of um, the fetal age to date the pregnancy, uh, the obstetrics mode will set that up so you can automatically calculate these things. Whereas if you remain in abdominal mode, you won't be able to do that. For the transvaginal uh, ultrasound, there's really one option. You're going to use your intracavitary probe, which has a microconvex array of transducers at its head. So. Again, always start transabdominally. That's going to give you the best view overall, the big picture of the abdomen, and use the patient with a full bladder ideally. So scanning through the bladder using the curvilinear probe, we want to get transverse views through the entire uterus, fanning down towards the cervix and all the way up through the fundus until you can no longer see the uterus. So transverse through and through and then move the probe to a sagittal orientation and scan all the way to the left and all the way to the right so that you've really insinated through the entire uterus, top to bottom, left to right, and you've seen every inch of it. Start off uh, with your probe just above the pubic symphysis. That's going to give you the best view through the bladder as a window, and then you may need to move the probe from there. In some patients, the only way you're going to see their uterus well is through the bladder, and in other patients, you actually can see the uterus very well through their subcutaneous tissue in the anterior wall of their abdomen, and the bladder just gets in the way. So it's going to vary patient to patient. And like most abdominal scanning, we're going to have the probe marker towards the patient's head when we scan in a longitudinal view and towards the patient's right when we're scanning through a transverse or a coronal view through the uterus. And again, the, trans, the uh, longitudinal view should look something like this, where we start with the bladder in the near field and the uterus behind that. Behind the uterus, we have the pouch of Douglas, and behind that, the rectum. And free fluid is going to tend to accumulate in the pouch of Douglas. So in the, trans, in the longitudinal view, the probe marker is going to be up towards the patient's head, as is demonstrated in this image. So here again, we see the probe in uh, the midline, just above the pubic symphysis, probe marker up towards the patient's head, and this will yield an image that looks something like this.
So anterior towards the top of the screen where we place the probe on the abdominal wall, posterior behind the uterus, and the probe marker is up towards the patient's head, so everything on the probe marker side of the screen will be towards the head, and everything away from the probe marker side of the screen will be towards the patient's feet. So the orientation will look something like the schematic on the top left here. And looking at a transverse or coronal view through the uterus, we see that the probe marker here is towards the patient's right-hand side, and that will lead to an image like this. So anteriorly, we see the bladder. Just posterior to that, we see the uterus as well as the endometrial stripe. The probe marker is towards the patient's right, so everything on the probe marker side here is the right. Everything away from the probe marker side is the left, and the far field, the distal part of the screen, will be posterior. And again, just like a CT scan image in this particular case, the patient's feet will be out towards you, their head is away from you. So, we've done transabdominal views, anterior to posterior, left to right, and head to foot. Now we look transvaginally. And um, we do this after the transabdominal view and have the patient empty their bladder. And a lot of times patients will empty their bladder and then you do a transabdominal ultrasound, you see there's a fair amount of fluid in their bladder. Let them go again because having an, a really empty bladder is going to serve two purposes. It's going to be much more comfortable for the patient when they have a probe inside of them and it make their pelvic exam more comfortable to begin with, um, but it's also going to uh, eliminate some acoustic artifacts that you'll see when you try to do transvaginal ultrasound with a full bladder. So this is going to be done with an intracavitary probe, as we've mentioned previously, and again, we want to scan in a sagittal plane, longitudinal, as well as a transverse or coronal view. With the sagittal plane, or the longitudinal view, the probe marker will be up towards the ceiling, and with a transverse view, the probe marker will be up towards, uh, out towards the patient's right-hand side. So here we see on this um, pelvic ultrasound phantom uh, that the probe marker is up towards the top, and that will give us a view something like this. And this can be a little bit tricky for people who are first uh, doing it. We see on the left side of your screen here the probe and uh, the, the uh, ultrasound beam as it comes out here, forming a fan that goes relatively towards the top left. So that means it's scanning through the uterus and the bladder. Now, the ultrasound machine screen always demonstrates the, the probe head as being at the top of the screen, and then it transmits downwards. So it's actually going to wind up anatomically looking like this upside down image of the pelvis where we're going to start with the um, point where the transducer connects with typically the cervix um, or right around the fornix and transmits downwards. So it's really sort of an upside down view of the uterus that you get. So when you see an image like this where we can see the anterior portion of the uterus, the fundus up here, and then we see posteriorly this is where the pouch of Douglas would be, which in this patient is a potential space. There's no fluid back there. And we see this nice, well-defined endometrial stripe in the center here that you can measure. So this is the type of view you want to see in a longitudinal view. And in a transverse view, you just rotate the probe 90 degrees. Now the probe marker is facing towards the patient's right-hand side. And it should yield an image like this, where again, we see anterior all the way around to posterior. And we see the endometrial stripe in the center of the image. So what kind of changes do we see in the uterus during pregnancy? The earliest changes are going to be a decidual reaction, and that's an increase in vascularity around the implantation site. We see um, more blood uh, vessel growth due to growth factors that are being released in the area, and it shows up as a bit brighter, so it looks like a bit of a brighter, thicker uh, endometrium. Now, that's a sign of early pregnancy, but it's not a specific sign. You can also see that with ectopic pregnancy, as uh, the uterus and the endometrium respond to hormonal changes that are coming from the ectopic pregnancy. So that's not an intrauterine pregnancy yet, or it's not a definitive intrauterine pregnancy yet. The next thing you'll see is fluid accumulation inside of a gestational sac, which should be well within the fundus. Now, <clears throat> That's also not a definitive intrauterine pregnancy because you can also see fluid accumulating in the setting of an ectopic pregnancy. That can be because of uh, blood. That can be because of interstitial fluid. And uh, so again, that's not a definitive sign of an intrauterine pregnancy. So the next change you're going to see is a yolk sac. And that's going to look like a little ring or a circle that's bright and echogenic, surrounded by fluid inside of a gestational sac. So at the point that the gestational sac demonstrates a yolk sac within it, you have a definitive intrauterine pregnancy, and that's the earliest cutoff that we tend to use at the point of care for emergency physicians 
to call this a intrauterine pregnancy. Occasionally, obstetricians or Radiologists will be comfortable calling a gestational sac with a double decidual ring uh, an early intrauterine pregnancy, but again, it reflects the uh, additional level of caution on the, ha uh, on the part of the emergency medicine community to define a yolk sac or more as an intrauterine pregnancy and, and nothing less than that. So the next thing we'll see after a yolk sac would be a fetal pole, and then after that you begin to see fetal cardiac activity. So more and more findings as the pregnancy progresses. So about when should we see this? Well, there's a bit of, about a week lag in between transvaginal findings and transabdominal findings. So we should typically see a gestational sac around five and a half to six weeks transabdominally, a little bit earlier transvaginally. A yolk sac at six or six and a half weeks transabdominally, about a, again a week earlier transvaginally. A fetal pole by about seven weeks, about six weeks transvaginally. And cardiac activity uh, about the same time, usually just a couple of days later. And greater than eight weeks, you should really see fetal parts. So let's look at the first finding here in an early intrauterine pregnancy. We see uh, here a gestational sac, and that is represented by this anechoic area inside of the fundus of the uterus. There's a bright echogenic area around it, and then there's a dark area, and then another bright area. And there's um, a reasonable amount written on this in the radiology literature, uh, calling this a double decidual sign, which in, by many authors is the first sign of an intrauterine pregnancy, but it's really not um, specific enough, and it has been shown that a, a similar appearance can happen with ectopic pregnancies as well, that some authors recommend not using this, again, as a sign of an intrauterine pregnancy. And certainly in the emergency medicine community and our guidelines from American College of Emergency Physicians uh, would argue that you should see at least a yolk sac. And there's actually a couple of problems with this image. One would be to look at this and say that it's definitively a gestational sac, meaning an early intrauterine pregnancy. It is either a gestational sac or a pseudogestational sac. It really can't be determined, and this definition really should be no definitive intrauterine pregnancy, sometimes shortened as NDIUP or no definitive IUP. So this does not rule out ectopic. Another problem with this single view is we have to hope that the provider actually got additional views. We don't see a full view of the uterus here. We see a bit of the anterior aspect here. We don't see around fully through the fundus. We don't see the posterior aspect of the uterus here. We're zoomed in closely enough that it's actually a bit difficult to say that we're truly looking inside the uterus. And if you get too close up on uh, a ring enhancing structure in the pelvis, you can sometimes focus right in on an echogenic ring of an ectopic pregnancy and make the false assumption that what you're looking at is a intrauterine pregnancy. So there's an equation uh, that some of my colleagues have uh, espoused, and that's P doesn't equal IUP. You can be fooled sometimes, and you see a pregnancy, to assume that it's an intrauterine pregnancy because that's what you're looking for. But that intrauterine part is really important. So assessing that the pregnancy you're looking at is actually inside the uterus is the only way to make sure that you're not looking at an ectopic. More on that to come. So let's look at this image instead, where we can see a transverse view of the uterus, anterior, posterior. We see a gestational sac and a yolk sac, and that's an intrauterine pregnancy. Let's have a look at it from a sagittal view as well. We see around the entire circumference of the uterus, which is very good, and we see a gestational sac with a yolk sac inside of it. These are appropriate images. It demonstrates that there is an intrauterine pregnancy, yolk sac or, or more. We've ruled out ectopic in this setting. Here as well, not a complete view, but we can see that there's a gestational sac and then a yolk sac within it. So this appearance here is consistent with uh, an intrauterine pregnancy, but it's important when looking at these sort of zoomed in images that that's not the only images you take. It's really important, as I've talked about before, to scan through the entire uterus, top to bottom, left to right, making sure you look behind it for signs of free fluid, for free intra-abdominal fluid, fluid in the pouch of Douglas, and that the gestational sac and yolk sac that you're visualizing are actually intrauterine structures. So another way to double check this, you've already started transabdominally before transvaginally, and that helps to avoid errors. You've scanned through the entire uterus, top to bottom, left to right, as I've mentioned many times, and you didn't just focus in on the yolk sac and zoom in on it really close and try to get a heart rate through it and lose sight of the big picture of, is this structure I'm looking at and I'm getting so excited about really inside the uterus?
Another way to check, another check and balance, is to look for something called a myometrial mantle. How thick is the myometrium around this suspected gestational sac? So measuring a myometrial mantle, and here we demonstrate the, the thinnest area of myometrium surrounding this gestational sac, is helpful. And it's helpful to determine that you don't have an interstitial ectopic. Because again, sometimes you'll look through the uterus and you'll see a gestational sac and you'll even see a yolk sac and you might even see fetal cardiac activity and a fetal pole. And when you look at the myometrial mantle, it's thin. So what's thin? Depending on who you read, less than eight millimeters or even less than five millimeters. Again, to be cautious, we recommend eight millimeters. If you see a myometrial mantle that's less than eight millimeters, that's concerning. It might be inside the uterus, but it might be in the interstitium. It might be um, uh, near the cornua. It might be near the cervix. So it could represent an interstitial ectopic, which might not rupture soon, but it will rupture later as it outgrows its, uh, the uterus's ability to contain the increasing blood supply and, um, and size of the developing fetus. So again, it's the thinnest part of the uterus surrounding the gestational sac, and it could be a sign of an interstitial ectopic, and we want to demonstrate that it's at least 8 millimeters. It's very important. So let's have a look at another uh, image here. Here we have a fetal pole, and a, uh, to, which is to the right inside this gestational sac. And we also see a yolk sac here defined by the arrow. Here we have a fetal pole inside of a gestational sac, inside of the uterus. And the provider has zoomed in and is using M mode and dropping the M mode line through the fetal cardiac activity. And we see here this repeating pattern. And while you don't get the detail that you would through an adult cardiology echo through the heart, we're not going to see the mitral valve here, but you can see a periodic flicker, which allows you to use the calipers on the machine to measure out a heart rate. Typically, a fetal heart rate should be somewhere in the 150 to 160 range in a normal pregnancy, and it's concerned for uh, fetal demise or fetal distress, which is probably not the right word to use in a, um, in a pregnancy this early. Um, it was certainly an abnormal sign when you have a, uh, uh, a fetal heart rate that's, uh, that's less than that. So I'm going to briefly speak about the ovaries. Um, I want to stress yet again that the way at, uh, we as emergency physicians rule out ectopic pregnancy is by ruling in intrauterine pregnancy. You don't need to look at the ovaries to rule in intrauterine pregnancy. And if you're new to ultrasound and you're, uh, you're just starting to um, do these studies and you're corroborating your findings with colleagues with uh, more experience or you're using radiology or obstetrics as your gold standard when you're evaluating your patients, if all you did was look at the uterus, and determine if there was a pregnancy inside the uterus or not, you've done your patients a great service. Uh, multiple studies have demonstrated that uh, if you took all comers in the emergency department who are coming in with first trimester vaginal bleeding or abdominal pain, you can rule out ectopic um, in up to 70% of these patients by demonstrating a yolk sac at the bedside. So 70% of the cases, which otherwise might have needed uh, radiology or obstetrics consultation, additional time and uh, money and uh, effort spent in the emergency department and additional resources can safely be discharged. And you can prove right with your bedside exam 70% of the time that there's an intrauterine pregnancy. And that's just with looking at the uterus. If you want to try to go after the ectopics and look in the ovaries, or if you're looking to reassure yourself because of your resources and your environment that the uh, ovaries look normal, um, that's a bit more of an advanced application, but we'll speak about some basics here. The ovaries, again, are going to be in between the uterus, which we can see on the right side of the screen, and the iliac vessels, which we can see on the left side of the screen. And again, just to... Uh, demonstrate that anatomy again, that the ovaries lie between the iliac vessels, which is much more lateral, and the uterus, which is much more central. So start off with a midline view of the uterus and scan out towards the left and out towards the right, and ideally you'll see the uh, ovaries just lateral to the uterus. And here we see a pretty typical appearance of the ovary. It's a reasonably well circumscribed structure that has a medium echo texture within its actual parenchyma, not that different than liver or spleen. Uh, 
and then we see follicles, which are really the hallmark of the ovary. So um, several anechoic cystic structures around this um, suspected ovary and its uh, appearance adjacent to the iliac vessels really confirm that this is in fact an ovarian tissue. And uh, it's sometimes described as having a chocolate chip cookie appearance, having this relatively round appearance with dark circles around it. So here we see a cyst, which is a very common thing that you can find. If you look at the calipers on the side here, this cyst is really just a little bit over um, a centimeter in diameter. And it always seems to look a bit bigger when you're scanning someone. So you put the probe and you're seeing everything sort of zoomed in because the intracavitary probe has such great resolution and you're looking at relatively small structures. So these cysts really pop out at you. And it's very common that you're going to see a corpus luteum cyst. Um, again, if you have questions or issues, uh, call upon your colleagues. Um, don't take a little bit of knowledge and, uh, and extrapolate it too far. When you, whenever you find things that you're not sure about, um, with ultrasound, it's no different than finding things you're not sure about on physical examination or, or x-rays or EKGs. Um, if you're reaching the, the limits of your comfort or experience or the clinical scenario doesn't exactly jive with the findings that you see in front of you, um, ask for help. Get a consultant to um, cooperate with you on the case. So let's look at a couple of examples of uh, intrauterine pregnancy or no intrauterine pregnancy. So here we see this longitudinal view, transvaginal, of the uterus. There's the fundus there. And there's a little hint here of an endometrial stripe in the center. In the coronal view, we again see the outline of the uterus here. Endometrial stripe in the center here, not as well described. And there is no gestational sac, no yolk sac, so in this case, no IUP. Here we see a yolk sac surrounded by a gestational sac, surrounded by myometrium. We don't see enough posterior. We don't see enough towards the fundus to, um, to fully prove this is an IUP. If this tr is truly the uterus and this is inside, then yes, it's an IUP, but this single image alone um, is, uh, is not sufficient and really uh, a more thorough examination through the entire uterus should happen but this is the general appearance that you'd look for inside the uterus to show that there's a yolk sac. Now this image, in contrast, demonstrates a nice full view of the uterus. There's a longitudinal view. All the way around here we can see down towards the cervix, we can see up towards the fundus here. We see a bright echogenic uh, area, um, which might be a decidual reaction surrounding a gestational sac. There might be something inside the uterus, and inside that gestational sac, but it's not really 100% clear. But looking in the transverse view, we can then see that in that same uterus, well demonstrated here, that there is in fact a ring uh, demonstrating a yolk sac. So there is a yolk sac, it's inside the gestational sac, which is inside the uterus, therefore there's an intrauterine pregnancy, and therefore no ectopic. One thing that you notice a little bit here is the um, uh, bladder here, and there's some posterior acoustic enhancement, uh, which is basically bright area posterior to the, um, to the bladder. And uh, in the physics uh, slide set, you can hear a little bit more about posterior acoustic enhancement. But here's an example where um, a little bit of a posterior acoustic enhancement here causes a bit of a side lobe artifact. In this particular case, it doesn't get in the way very much. But with more urine in the bladder, a larger posterior acoustic enhancement artifact happens, which can cause a larger uh, side lobe or grating lobe artifact, which can streak all the way across the uterus and obscure images through the uterus. So it's one of the reasons why it's so important to have the patient empty their bladder. And it's a, a very common cause of frustration for people who see a view of the uterus that's obscured by, for lack of a better term, a sonographic lens flare going right across their image and obscuring the view underneath. So when you see that, just have the patient empty their bladder and you can often get a much better image afterwards. <clears throat> so here we see uterus and there's the fundus down here, we're seeing a lot more of this streaking artifact, side lobe or grating lobe artifact. Um, and it's coming from this big fluid uh, filled area here and the posterior acoustic enhancement from it. So at first this is very confusing and, um, and it could be, uh, you, you could see that there might be free fluid, maybe this is the pelvic cul-de-sac. Um, or another option is that the probe was held upside down. And it can be confusing sometimes for people holding that uh, vaginal probe, the intracavitary probe, um, upside down. 
So if you see an image like that, make sure that you have your probe marker set appropriately. It should be up towards the patient's, uh, it should be towards the patient's right hand side for uh, transverse or coronal views, and it should be up towards the ceiling for uh, views through a sagittal or longitudinal plane. So here really what we see is just a distended bladder, a full bladder, with a pretty normal appearing uterus. There's a little hint of endometrial stripe there, and while I, in this image it doesn't seem like there's a, uh, an intrauterine pregnancy, um, we need to fan through from left to right to assess that better, and having the patient empty their bladder will eliminate all of this side lobe or grating lobe artifact that can really be the bane of your existence when you're looking transvaginally through the uterus. So here, there's, again, let's assume in this particular case that the provider had scanned through left to right, top to bottom again, um, and what we see is a fetal pole and a yolk sac. So there is a intrauterine pregnancy here. But here's another common finding. There is an anechoic area um, surrounding the gestational sac, and this is a subchorionic hemorrhage. Large subchorionic hemorrhages, uh, depending on which literature you read, uh, uh, subchorionic hemorrhages extending greater than 50% of the circumference of the gestational sac do increase the rates of miscarriage, um, but uh, smaller ones, um, less than half or even less than a third, depending on which author, um, do not increase the rate of miscarriage. So it might be something that you want to point out to the patient that they do have this subchorionic hemorrhage. It can be uh, blamed as a cause for bleeding, um, and it's certainly worth um, obstetrics uh, follow-up and uh, making the patient aware that this is um, something that's uh, complicating their early pregnancy. Now here we have a transabdominal view through the uterus. The uterus appears a bit ill-defined. Um, in this particular patient's case, there's just not a great acoustic window, and what looks to be the bladder here um, is not uh, distended enough to provide a good window. There's definitely no intrauterine pregnancy um, inside here. Uh, the same patient, they scanned in the right upper quadrant because, again, if you find an intrauterine pregnancy, you've ruled out ectopic. If you don't find an intrauterine pregnancy, you'll need to keep looking. And keep looking might mean uh, doing a fast examination, which is a good time to do it while you already have the patient laying down flat and you already have an abdominal probe on them, or doing a transvaginal ultrasound. So we're looking further now because we didn't see an intrauterine pregnancy. This is what Morrison's pouch looked like. So there's free fluid up here. If you want more information about the FAST examination, look at the tutorials on sanaem.us or have a look at the uh, FAST uh, um, exam lecture. So looking again now here back in the pelvis, we see the bladder here, the uterus in the center, and then this ring-enhancing thick-walled structure. So again, in a pregnant young woman with abdominal pain, vaginal bleeding, especially tachycardic, hypotensive, uh, the presumption of ectopic pregnancy can be life-saving. So uh, that patient was taken to the operating room, had laparoscopy, and in fact, an uh, ruptured ectopic was found. So here's another example. Uh, inter, uh, this is a uh, uh, intracavitary view, a vaginal probe being used, um, and we see some uterine tissue here, and there seems to be a uh, gestational sac and a yolk sac. Um, but again, we need to scan back and forth through this to make sure that this is actually an intrauterine structure. In this particular patient's case, this structure was extrauterine, and there was uterine tissue here, um, and there was a pregnancy here, but that P did not equal IUP. That was a pregnancy that was outside of the uterus, and this was a ectopic pregnancy. Here again, uh, an abdominal uh, view was obtained, and this, this case really highlights the importance of looking at an abdominal view. There was a large gestational sac, a fetal uh, pole, fetal cardiac activity, feel movement even, um, surrounded by this uh, medium echotexture structure, and initially a presumption of uh, intrauterine pregnancy was made. But because the patient was tachycardic, hypotensive, was having a lot of vaginal bleeding and abdominal pain, um, a little more assessment was made, and we see this structure inferior to that. So if this is the uterus and this is an intrauterine pregnancy, then is this an adexal mass? What's, what's going on here? And a little more uh, sleuthing uh, with ultrasound determined that, in fact, um, this was the uterus on the right-hand side of your screen. And the ectopic pregnancy 
uh, was to the left of the screen. So this was a, an ectopic pregnancy rupturing relatively late and uh, causing a lot of pain, uh, hemodynamic instability, and bleeding. So here's an example of what a nice sweep through the uterus should look like, starting off the fundus, sweeping downwards closer to the cervix, really following the endometrial stripe in the center of the uterus all the way down. And we see no intrauterine pregnancy here, uh, but we also get a good view that there's not really any significant free fluid in the back. There could be a little trace there or not. There might be arcuate vessels towards the posterior aspect there. And uh, so this looks like a very normal but empty uterus. So normal in the sense that there's um, uh, no IUP and it's a good evaluation, but there could, this does not rule out ectopic pregnancy. And now we see a sagittal sweep. So we go from one side to the other. So in the middle of this clip, as it repeats, you'll see a nice left to right um, uh, of your screen uh, view of the endometrial stripe. And um, so we really look now in both planes, uh, sagittal and transverse or coronal, through this entire uterus and found no intrauterine pregnancy. So depending on the other clinical uh, scenario, um, the patient's amount of tenderness, whether there were any masses, if you can evaluate the ovaries and make sure that there's no free fluid or masses around those ovaries, this could very well be a patient who's safe to be discharged and follow up with obstetrics in 48 hours. It might be a patient that you'll uh, need to get a radiology study to confirm that the anexa look okay. Uh, it might be a patient that you would get uh, OBGYN evaluation. And again, this empty uterus means that you haven't ruled out ectopic, whether the beta level is 30 30, or the beta level is 30,000. So you might be more concerned if the beta level is 30,000, but you can't be unconcerned if it's 30, because that doesn't rule out ectopic. So here we see good images being obtained, just no definitive IUP. And here's another example. Here's just a still image of an adnexal mass where there's a yolk sac inside of this gestational sac, but this entire structure is extra uterine. And finally here, so we see a fetal fetus, we see fetal parts, we even see fetal cardiac activity, and as we scan a little bit further around, we see, um, so let's, let's look at this, so maybe it's an intrauterine pregnancy, and uh, let's just double check this by looking at the myometrial mantle, and if you look over here, that's a really thin myometrial mantle. Uh, and it looks a little bit thicker in this plane, but in a couple of planes, that's very, very thin, and there's maybe a bit of free fluid going on. So as we look at this, um, we can get very easily distracted by a fetus that's moving. But what you saw just for a second in that last frame, and what you could see off to the edge here, is that's the uterus. So that's a pregnancy, and that's the uterus. Therefore, this is not an intrauterine pregnancy, and we're looking at an ectopic. So uh, this is a uh, clip from uh, my colleague Mike Lambert uh, from Chicago and, uh, and his, um, his colleague uh, from UC Irvine, um, Chris Fox. So I, I appreciate uh, their letting me use this clip. But this, this clip is one of the best examples I can see of uh, the danger of getting fooled, getting zoomed in, um, letting the movement, letting the excitement of seeing a fetus, letting maybe family members in the room who are worried, and then all of a sudden seeing what looks blatantly to a lay person like uh, a fetus uh, swimming around um, and, and uh, potentially causing great risk and harm to your patient by missing that this is exactly the diagnosis that you're hoping to exclude. So... Um, are there any guidelines uh, on what we should be doing? So American College of Emergency Physicians has clinical policies, and you can find them on their website. And they do have a couple of policies that uh, relate to the evaluation of ectopic uh, pregnancy. Here we see critical issues in the evaluation and management of patients presenting with early pregnancy. So first clinical question, should the emergency physician obtain a pelvic ultrasound in a clinically stable patient presenting with abdominal pain vaginal bleeding, and a beta HCG below a discriminatory threshold, whatever threshold you want to define, 2,000, 1,000, 1,500. So their recommendation uh, is to perform or obtain, so you do it yourself or get radiology um, to do it for any symptomatic pregnant patients with a beta HCG below any threshold. So it doesn't matter what the beta HCG level is. And unfortunately, it's only a level C recommendation because there aren't any randomized controlled studies looking at this, uh, but based on best evidence available um, and according to the literature review, it is a recommendation. So if you have an indeterminate transvaginal ultrasound, 
what is the diagnostic utility of a beta HCG for possible ectopic pregnancy? So don't use the beta HCG to exclude the diagnosis of ectopic. And a level C recommendation, obtain specialty consultation or arrange close outpatient follow-up for all patients with an indeterminate pelvic ultrasound. So according to the literature, maybe around 25, 28% of your patients are going to have that. Um, you're going to have 70% of patients that you'll be able to find an in, in, intrauterine pregnancy on your own. Maybe an additional 10, 15, 20% of patients, depending on which studies you look at, will have an intrauterine pregnancy definitively proven by radiology, and a small proportion will have that ectopic diagnosed in the emergency department at that time as well. So again, uh, my math was wrong a minute ago, but probably somewhere in that 15 to 20% range, you're going to have um, patients that go home with an indeterminate um, uh, pelvic ultrasound. So we can't say they don't have an ectopic, and we don't know that they have an intrauterine pregnancy, but they're not unstable, and they feel well, and they're not that tender, and they're not bleeding too badly, and they go home with close OBGYN follow-up. Repeat beta HCG in 48 hours, and repeat imaging. So in summary, if you have an IUP, you don't have an ectopic. The caveats to this are you obviously should have a higher level of suspicion of the patient with prior ectopic pregnancies, abnormal anatomy, instrumentation, multiple pelvic infections. So in other words, someone who has a really high pretest probability of having ectopic to begin with, that gives them by corollary a higher chance of having a heterotopic, as do patients with um, in vitro fertilization or assisted reproductive technology use. So keep uh, a lower threshold for uh, radiology scanning, OBGYN consultation in those patients. But for your relatively more straightforward patients, which are still the majority of our patients with this type of complaint, a um, evaluation with um, ultrasound demonstrating an IUP rules out ectopic. Always start transabdominally. You will be fooled by abnormal anatomy. You will be fooled by extrauterine structures that seem like they're intrauterine. You'll be fooled because you'll miss pockets of fluid in the right or left upper quadrant in patients that are unstable. You'll be fooled by patients who think they're only six weeks or four weeks pregnant and they're 26 or 24 weeks pregnant. So please start transabdominally, full bladder, let the patient uh, urinate for their pelvic examination and then do the transvaginal ultrasound at the same time you do your pelvic exam. Sweep through two planes, look through the entire uterus, top to bottom, left to right, to ensure that you don't miss anything, and that you ensure that if you do see an intrauterine pregnancy, it's right in the center of the uterus where it belongs. Pregnancy doesn't equal intrauterine pregnancy, so don't get uh, fooled by finding uh, the uh, yolk sac and then assuming everything around it is the uterus. Measure a myometrial mantle. That will help you to protect against the previous uh, pitfall that I just mentioned, as well as look for interstitial ectopics. And if you choose to, you can explore the adnexa. They're not a necessary part of the evaluation for uh, intrauterine pregnancy. If you start off and that's a little more complicated and it's a little bit more of a fishing expedition, frankly, until you have some experience, if you're comfortable just looking at the uterus, you can really serve your patients well just looking at the uterus. Um, if you choose to explore the adnexa, just realize it's more complicated. There's a wider variety of, um, of uh, pathology that you can find there, and uh, sometimes the ovaries are a little more difficult to assess. So certainly you're welcome to do it, but really focus on the uterus and not necessarily the adnexa. So uh, if you have any other questions, if you uh, have comments, uh, or if you want to see more tutorials, more tips and tricks, a lot more posts uh, that you can search for uh, on the topic of uh, OB and GYN ultrasound, please visit sinaiem.us. And that's another way to get in contact with me as well. So thank you very much.